What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Fire Builders Live. Like always, my name, Josh Corporal. I am streaming live from Key West, Florida. And today I have a very special guest, Danny Blechner on. Danny, welcome to Fire Builders Live. Thank you for having me. We're excited to be here. Hello, Josh. <laughs> it's going to be good. It's going to be a great interview. I can't wait to talk about this because it's around one of my favorite topics, i.e. writing a book. And, uh, and before we get into all of this stuff, let me explain to everybody listening, watching at home what we do on Fire Builders Live. We stream live six days a week, six different guests per week, and we take these big ideas, these big goals, we break them down into small steps, things that you can focus on, things that you can do consistently every day. And today is no different, my friends. Let me explain a little bit about Daniela's life and what she has accomplished in her life. It is very impressive. She, I mean, from climbing Mount Kilimanjaro while having the flu, which we should talk about, to becoming a speaker, a best-selling author, an award-winning entrepreneur, she has an inspiring journey. Her debut book, Mr. Wrong, reached three bestseller lists just hours after being published, and she has mentored over 190 authors in their careers, assisting them from everything, from transforming their powerful stories and messages into successful books. Now, the thing is with books that most people can write, right? whether it's their own personal story or some documenting the lives of a real person or a fictitious person, most people can write. But the thing that's, that absolutely separates successful writers, the, the ones that rocket to the top are the ones that identify very clearly who they want to reach and who they want to impact. Because if you do this correctly, the writing journey then just kind of almost writes itself, for lack of a better word, that becomes way easier to, to do that. And that, my friends, is why I am so excited to have Daniela on the show. I can't think of a better person to talk to about this. So, Daniela, again, it's so great to have you. And welcome again to Fire Builders Live. Thank you so much. Again, thank you so much for having me on Fire Builders Live. I'm very excited about this. <laughs> this is going to be good. I uh, <clears throat> So we... Um, you know, we had this scheduled earlier, we had to push it back and everything. And I'm so glad like the timing just worked out perfect. Um, and really like, uh, you know, I, I didn't tell you before the show, I don't know if you've heard anything, but what you'll, you might hear in the background are a whole bunch of roosters cause I'm in Key West and they are everywhere on the Island. So don't let that distract you. The roosters, they've been pretty subdued today. Uh, but, uh, but okay, so tell me a little bit about where you are in the world and what is a typical day life like in Danny's life these days? Interesting question. So first of all, I am in London, Southeast London in England, the UK. Um, great to connect with you in uh, Florida. Awesome. It's the great thing about the digital life. An everyday day for me in my world uh, has very much changed, I guess, from, you know, before lockdown to, to how we are now. Um, it, so let's take today, for example. So today, um, get up when I want to get up. <laughs> I had a few consultations with some authors who um, want to learn about the publishing process, possibly want to publish a book. So I had a few consultations, run through some submissions. So people who want to publish a book, they will submit their books via Word document. So just reading through a lot of those this morning, getting back to emails. I had a few interviews today, all from the comfort of my home. So, you know, it was great. And now I'm, I'm speaking with you and working on, I've got a few authors who are publishing books. Uh, they've got March and April published dates. So just working on getting those wrapped up, doing the finishing touches. So it's all, it's all going over here. I tell you, is this the last interview that you've got today or do you have more stuff to do after this? This is the last interview, so after that, oh, there we go. <laughs> after that, I'll be uh, going through some more submissions, and um, one of the authors that we're working with have published dates coming up very soon, the 13th of March, so I need to start the publishing process, which I'll be doing as soon as we finish this interview. I like it. Well, I'm curious, the, the consultations that you have, like, what's the most common question when people want to know about the publishing process? What do they ask? <laughs> Really interesting. I mean, the most common question that I ask um, is, who is your book for? And I know that we're going to crack into this today. So I'll say, who, who's your target audience for your book? And a lot of the time I get everyone. 
<laughs> and we spoke about this earlier. Yeah. A book is never for everyone. It's not to say that anyone can't read it, but you've got to be really, really clear on who your target audience is because you do your target audience a huge disservice when you generalize them under under anyone. Because obviously the, the way you would speak to a 16 year old would be completely different language to somebody who's in their 60s, for example. You know, they're facing different challenges. They're going through different things. One word can mean something completely different, <laughs> you know, across the different target readers. So that's a question that I, I, I ask a lot and the answer that is most common. Um, a lot of questions I get asked would be, um, how do I promote my book? How do I market my book once my book is finished? What do I do? That's quite a big question. Yeah. That's a huge one because be, some people I feel just want to write a book just to write a book. Be like, all right, like <laughs> I've done it. Uh, and then it's like, yeah, but then now you can use it as a tool to get you to the next step. Have you figured out what that next step is? And they're like, nah, not really. I'm like, well, maybe <laughs> let's talk about that. Uh, and by the way, uh, we got Roz talking. I know that <clears throat> that guy, Roz Slaughter, if you don't know him, uh, I think I might, I, Roz might have written a book. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. But Roz, if you're watching and you want to write a book, you should well, seriously, uh, uh, stay tuned for this episode because this is going to be a good one. I think, has anybody ever come to you with too narrow of an audience? Ooh. I don't think they have. I mean, no, they, they haven't actually. Usually I get people who are too general with their audience and we need to hone it down and maybe get primary, secondary audiences. Yeah. Like, can there, can there possibly be a too narrow? As you were saying that, you know, I, it's so easy to go broad, but uh, can you actually, can you actually like exclude people that maybe shouldn't be excluded? I mean, you can, I mean, actually, now that you've asked me that question, I did speak to somebody last week and they were writing a book for creatives, uh, mainly animators or illustrators who might feel a little bit fed up with lockdown. They're trying to get their business going, but maybe things have slowed down a bit. So that's obviously a very niche target market. So it, it more happens when it comes to you know, specialist books. Um, I think you can get quite narrow <laughs> with your books, you know, fishing in one particular river, maybe that's going to be just for a very <laughs> tiny, <laughs> tiny amount of um, people. But I think it links to what is the purpose of your book then? If your purpose of your book is to directly speak to these direct niche um, audience of people and you want to create a community within that audience, then that works for you. But if you want sort of commercial success or you want your book to reach as many people as possible, I think it's important to make sure that your message is a, is a universal one that can transcend different groups of people. Yeah, 100%. Well, and when you say that, like, you're not just talking the talk, like you've walked the walk in this experience. Just to give people some context, like, explain a little bit about how you got to where you are now, like, because you've written, like, with Mr. Wrong, uh, <laughs> shot up. So what happened there? So, I mean, I've always wanted to be an author. From a very young age, I was asked, you know, what do you want to do when you're older? You know, as you get asked. And it was always like, I'm going to be an author. It was never a question. I love writing and coming up with stories. And so, um, and that's why I love young people, because there's never any limitation. You don't have these conditionings placed upon you. It's, you know, I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, with, you know, without any kind of doubt about it. Um, so I initially started off writing because that's my one love that's my passion um i didn't set out to set up a publishing company so the first book that i wanted to write actually and that i have written uh a long time ago and i was actually a, a young adult fantasy book it was aimed to be a trilogy but that's not the first book i've published and i haven't actually published that book <laughs> yet um mr wrong is i've got it here it's a collection of real life relationship and dating disasters <laughs> so relationships <sorry. laughs> Written by women across the world have encountered this infamous Mr. Wrong character. You've got success stories in there, um, stories for men too, to get the other perspective. But more than that, it's a place to really self-discover and look at limiting belief systems we may have about love, relationships, ourselves. And so it started off with that book. And I had women, I set up a blog, um, create these different Mr. Wrong characters, shared a few stories, 
I said, look, is anyone else experiencing this? And I had women from America, Australia, Canada, Europe, all over the world sending in their stories. I thought, wow, I've, I've got to really document these and honor these stories. Well, I would imagine even like even more so with internet dating, you know? Yeah. <laughs> There's a whole section on internet dating. <laughs> yeah. So in fact, we published a book recently called uh, Cupid's Cock Ops, uh, which is all based on internet dating, actually. <laughs> Great book. Um, so I had all these women with their stories and I absolutely wanted to honor these stories. And I, I realized that I'm onto something here, you know, it, it, it's deeper than just these stories. It's working through these stories and, and to see what we can learn from them and share them. Um, so I was writing the book and I did what they tell you to do, which is work out how you're going to get published. And so I got a book called Getting Published by Harry Bingham, which tells you step by step what you need to do. And I was going to go the traditional route. I wrote a query letter, which is like a one pager about yourself and your book, sent off three chapters to these agents. Um, and then during that time, it normally takes between three and five months for a reply. And so I waited and I stopped writing. So I waited, waited and waited. After about three or four months, all the letters came in. I say all the letters, three or four. And it was like great writing capability, you know, really witty, great subject. Uh, great content it's themes however we're looking for somebody with more of a following or somebody who's got a marketing plan and i was like well i don't want to i'm an author i don't want to i don't want to do marketing thank you very much um, so i got rejected and i thought okay well i either i can just crawl and say who am i to write a book or i can possible rejection so I did what they tell you not to do, and that was I was applying to traditional publishing houses like Random House, Penguin, HarperCollins, knowing that I needed an agent. And then I waited and I waited and I waited. And then after about three or four months again, I got one letter back and it was great writing capability, really witty. There's a lot in this book. However, we don't take on unsolicited authors, so authors without an agent. And it was that when I had that epiphany moment that I wasn't waiting for a reply or a response. I was waiting for validation. You know, I was waiting for permission. I was waiting for someone to say, your story matters. You matter. Let's get this book out here. You've got great talent. Yeah. yeah. And because it had other women's stories in there and stories from men too, I thought, well, they've contributed them. I've, I've got to honor these stories. So by hook or by crook, I've got to do it myself. And so I researched you know, how to publish a book extensively, set up Conscious Dreams Publishing, published through my own company, um, did quite well, got on a few bestseller lists, got into got in the front window of Waterstones, which is the equivalent to your Barnes and Noble on Valentine's Day. I uh, got some good press as well. And I had lots of women at the time, mainly women saying, how did you do that? Can you help us? And so I assisted them through the publishing journey just as a labor of love. Um, they started doing really well, started getting paid speaking, get engagements. And I thought, I should have charged for this. <laughs> hmm. And so um, I just set up Conscious Dreams Publishing because I was getting more and more everyday people who've overcome extraordinary things with stories. And Pu Conscious Dreams Publishing was born from there, really, and we've been going ever since for five years. Well, okay, so question for you about that then. Do you feel like the success that you had was it more about the process that you figured out along the way, or was it more about the story and the meat of the book that led to the success? Oh, that's a great question. I, I'm going to say both. Um, starting off as someone who's a writer and just didn't really want to learn about the publishing process and just wanted a kind of done for you, you know, go with a traditional company, get them to do it, they do all the marketing. I feel a great sense of reward and success in the sense that I every single step was through me learning and, and doing myself and I'm really happy with the product. Um, but I think what the success, the real success for me is seeing the impact of the book. And I always talk about to the authors, what's your why behind your book? What's your message? What impact do you want to have? And so when I had women inboxing me saying, wow, this really helped me with my relationship or it actually helped me to walk away from a relationship that wasn't good for me or identify things about myself, um, it's really changed the trajectory of my life. That to me was the ultimate success. And obviously getting into Waterstones as well was pretty, pretty good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, like I, uh, I had a, I was part of two big, 
big book launches, both with Penguin Random House and uh, and we dealt with Waterstones just a little bit and kind of held like you know just handled stuff over in the UK with that. And it's it's interesting because you know, what you just said about the whole like trying to pitch them and the marketing plan like that's exactly what we saw too it's uh they're very interested in the marketing and you say to yourself you say to yourself okay well if that's the case and they're just worried about selling more and having the marketing and the process behind it what are they actually looking for good stories as well and if so like what do they base what do they base this subjective like good on um it's a really interesting question and and you it doesn't necessarily have an answer. So you just say to yourself, man, like, why am I even dealing with them in the first place? Then I might as well just go my own way. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I guess the great, the good thing about going with some traditional companies, because not all of them are, I know people who publish traditionally and they had to compromise, you know, a lot of themselves and their voice, but also maybe had their book marketed in the way that they maybe didn't want to. Um, and, maybe not at all some of them you know the royalties haven't been as good as when they've gone to self-publishing because obviously they have the, the the royalties for themselves but i think if the traditional publishing company has instant access to waterstones and the contacts and the marketing and all of that then that's you know that's that's i would never i wouldn't turn down a good deal <laughs> that's powerful that's like a huge negotiation chip you know and by the way so shay uh shay put up um I love how you spun your no into your next opportunity and started your own. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so okay. Well, um, so once you did that and you started helping helping these women create their own, I mean, fulfill their publishing dreams, their book dreams. Um, I I would imagine that a number of them come to you with just an idea. Or do they actually have like a manuscript that they have written and that's when they come to you? So we work with people who have a fully a full manuscript and they'll, they'll make a submission and we go into the publishing process after obviously reviewing it. Um, but we do get some people who come with an idea. And so during that 30 minute phone consultation um, with those sorts of clients, I would talk through, okay, so what's your message? What's your why? Who's your audience? Now let's talk through structure. And so I'll give them some tips as to how to structure their book so that by the end of the phone call, they've got a really clear idea of how they're going to start structuring their book, which means they can then go on to write it and then come back to us. Um, but I did realize that there were a lot of people who were coming with ideas, but had no idea how to write or to structure. And so I set up a workshop called The Power of Your Story, which we now do online. And part of that is not just about the, the, the structure of the book and writing the book, but it's about um, planning the bigger vision. So how are you going to get book, um, press for your book? Are you going to create online courses off the back of your book? Do you want to get speaking gigs? So there's so many different modules and facets to that particular workshop, but it was really geared at those who just got the idea but don't really know how to start. What do you find uh, when you go over some of this stuff? Like, what do you find that most people do? Do they create a course on the back end of their book or do they link it in with their teaching or do they just use it as like essentially a super powerful business card? Like, how do most people use it? Everyone's really different. So I don't think you can see the expansion game behind me. You can see, here you go, on my banner. Uh, I'm trying to point, but it's all opposite. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This lovely lady, Gosha. Yep. And you can see the book on the shelf, there you go, the expansion game. She's actually <laughs> a transformational coach. Um, and she created a powerful tool, which she now calls the expansion game, uh, which is how to transform your fear into your greatest, into your brilliance. And, and she didn't have a name for this particular tool that she was using until somebody said, oh, you know that tool you use with, with your clients, helping them to release fear. Can I use that in my book? what's it called and she's like well it doesn't have a name and then she realized i've got to give it a name i've got to trademark it and i need to write a book about all these amazing success stories she's had with clients who've used the expansion game and so she wrote a book off the back of that and she's created um, an online workshop called the expansion game so she's trademarked the whole thing 
she does um, one day one day workshops are called the expansion game and she, her technique is called the expansion game so she's built a whole brand around a particular facet of her, her her work we've got another lady called Usha who's on our banner here somewhere at the bottom <laughs> right. she's a child psychologist child and adult psychologist and she wrote a book called your happy child a parenting book and it's broken up into 10 proven steps to raising a happy child so off the back of that she's got a 10-part module based on the teachings within her book uh, she was going to schools working with teachers parents guardians and, and children um running a workshop called your happy child so she's based a whole brand around it you know but some people just want to publish a book um because it's a legacy you know especially poets you know it, it it's great because they can go into schools and perform their poetry it goes along with what they do in terms of performance poetry and some people just want to publish books because they want something as a family keepsake so everyone's really different I think. yeah like uh it's just want to do it because it's kind of badass and like uh yeah. you know it's like awesome to see your own book and like hold it in your hands 100 percent, definitely well the the thing that stops people that you have seen from writing is it because they start to second guess that somebody would actually read the book? Hmm. There's a lot around that, actually. And I think there's definitely people who are writing um, their personal stories. There's a lot of um, reticence around that. So it could be, first of all, who wants to read my story? Does it matter? Is it really going to impact people? Or am I just writing it for me? And then there's sometimes a worry of like how people might perceive them. Sometimes I might be revealing things that they haven't, people don't necessarily know that they're, they're close to. So there's a lot of res, um, fear and doubt around that. You get some people who, and funnily enough, Gosha here, um, she said that she had to actually use the expansion game technique on herself because she's dyslexic. She's also got a fear of being criticized. And so she had to use this technique to release this fear of being criticized, this fear of people thinking, you know, who are you to write a book? And she worked with a writing coach and her, her book is fantastically written. And so she actually <laughs> released a lot of fear she had around, you know, her writing her own book using her own technique, the expansion game. So yeah, I, there is a lot of fear in terms of letting go of your, your baby. Really, I think. Yeah, and putting it out there into the world, right? And, and opening it up to criticism. Yeah, 100%. You know? That's a huge thing, it's a huge thing. And, uh, and okay, well, so, but if, I come to you, you know, when I ask that question about like, do they come to you with an idea or a, or a finished manuscript? In the context of coming up with the like, who is this for? I would imagine it's almost better if they just come to you with an idea so you can mold around that at the very beginning instead of me being like, hey, I just spent the last three years writing this thing, but I it's for everybody. And you're like, oh my God, no. <laughs> Let's go back to the drawing board. Yeah. Yes, yes. That definitely has happened. I've um, spoken to people who, um, during our free 30 minute consultation sessions on the phone, they've published a book before. And I said, okay, well, tell me about the experience. How, how's it doing? How's it selling? What, what have you done with it since? And they're like, oh, we're just sitting on sitting on the shelves on, the, on Amazon now. Are you promoting it? What are you doing? And they're, they're wondering why they haven't got sales because, well, I mean, they haven't promoted it. If you're not telling people about it, unless you've got a, great team of people marketing your book behind you then it's going to get lost and so they've come and they've said right you know i want to republish my book i didn't really i just threw it out there and so we'll start back from the drawing board let's look at it who's your target market let's go backwards let's create a plan so that when it comes out you know you know what joint ventures you might be looking for uh what events you might be speaking at um online now uh, you know, what kind of bookshops are you going to target? I mean, there's no point in taking your your transformational, amazing transformational life coaching book to a children's bookstore, you know? So it's like thinking ahead of time where you're going to go and how you're going to plan to market that book. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, and then just that simple act of planning, man, it makes such a huge difference. And yeah. I would imagine it also just the idea of planning informs you of the audience in a way as well. Um, and let's go into that a little bit. Like if I sat down with you and I was like, all right, Danny, uh, I want to write a book. 
and you say, all right, well, who's it for? And I'm like, uh, men. You're just like, all right, good start. Uh, let's get a little bit deeper. What kinds of things, how do you help people narrow it down? Well, ask some questions, you know, if you were to describe your book in <laughs> some of the questions I asked, give us a one liner about your book. So my one liner about my book is it's a collection of stories written by women across the world who've encountered the infamous Mr. Wrong, but it's a place to self discover. So it's all about the wording in that, you know, straight away that it's a collection of stories written by women. So, you know, the form it's a collection of stories written by women. So the audience is going to be women um mr wrong you know it's going to be about be about relationships maybe not great relationships but there's an element of self-discovery self-development because it's got the word self-discovery so get them to come out with a one-liner that completely encapsulates their book and um, a lot of people always feel put on the spot because i don't actually know because about, i don't know how i'd say it in a one-liner so i say right this one-liner every time you do an interview you need to be completely comfortable with encapsulating what your book is in that really short sentence and then your why. So my why for the book is, I wrote this book because I want to unite, inspire and empower women, giving us a place, no, what is it? <laughs> giving us as a platform to share our stories and self-discover. So we know the why behind the book. It's about uniting, inspiring and empowering. So write down your one-liner, write down your why. So you as a writer are really clear about your audience. And then you can start honing it down from there. Then we'll know, okay, well, is this going to be for a woman who's not particularly interested in self-discovery it might interest them but they're not my core audience i'm looking for a woman who can relate to some of these stories some of these disaster stories maybe they're on a journey of self-discovery maybe they want to change the traje trajectory of their life maybe they want to reflect on their relationships let's get really deep and clear about your audience let's give them a name so my my reader is melissa so when i'm writing i'm thinking what would melissa think would she think this is funny would she relate to this bit? What, how's she feeling right now? As opposed to, this is written for any woman who wants to pick it up. Can you see? Do you, uh, have you based <laughs> Melissa on somebody that you know personally? Just curious. No. no? <laughs> Maybe me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's just the name I gave to the, my avatar reader. Would the uh, the idea of of kind of, projecting Melissa's like thoughts and feelings into the things that you're writing, um, I think is super smart. Like I actually, I know somebody that does that where the, with their avatar, the person that they're thinking of, they've given them a name. They've also got like a photograph of them and it might be oh, just a photograph that they got online somewhere, some random person, right? But they printed it out and taped it right there on their wall. So that they, every single time they do anything, they like look into that picture and they're like, all right, Frank or Melissa or whatever. Like, what do you think? And uh, yeah. I love that. That's fantastic. That's I'm going to do that for my next book. <laughs> Well, what have you found as far as the tagline goes? Because I know some people that spend a lot of time trying to concisely encapsulate what they're doing in just a short one-liner. Is there a situation? I mean, you can you can can you overanalyze it, or like do you just have to sort of get it until it's good enough and then put it out there in the world, see if people understand it, constantly talk about it, and refine refine it that way? I mean, I guess you're, you're right. You probably could analyze it. <laughs> you can over I think you can overanalyze anything. I think um, great books can also come from people who are writing to their younger self. You know, maybe they're reflecting on their story. Maybe they have overcome huge things in their life and they want to connect to that inner child. So they they, they already have an intimate relationship with their with themselves, hopefully, and their reader. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think you're right. It can be overanalyzed. You don't want to be kind of paralyzed with fear. Will she understand what this word means? Would she say that? Hmm. You know, you've got to write. You've got you've got to balance it out. You got to write from the heart, really. When you okay, so question for you. This is this is good because when I think about it, if I were to write a book and I was like writing this tagline, I would I would probably write it, I'd spend some time on it, and then I would say it to other people. I'd be like, Hey, yo, I'm writing a, I'm writing a book. Uh, it's about yeah, 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 and, and go over it. And if they have like a, oh man, that's awesome. I totally get that response. I'm like, yeah, nailed it. Like it's getting closer. But if they go, uh, interesting. You're just like, mm, 
uh, need some work. It, yeah. Is that, um, have you found, is that kind of what you do too? Or do you do something along those lines? Well, that's super smart because it's, it's your, as much as we might love writing, the book isn't for us, it's for your reader. So how do they speak? What language do they use? You've got to run it by them. Does this make sense to you? Um, some of the things that I suggest to authors is create questionnaires maybe. Do Facebook Lives or interviews with people. Um, get to your core audience. Ask them questions and you'll be informed by their responses what kind of language they use. And if certain words or phrases are repeated over and over again within that target audience, then you know, right, I'm on the right track. We're speaking the same lingo. We're, or you can learn from that and say, oh, right, okay, so these are the kind of words that they use. Yeah. Um, running it by your audience, I think, is really important. Another thing that I say to authors is when they finish writing, you never finish writing, but when you, feel <laughs> you, <laughs> when you feel you've got your last first draft, send it to some beta readers. So beta readers are like your test readers. Give it, don't give it to your best friend or your mum or whoever, because if they're a good, well, then m most of the time they'll just say to you, it was good. You know, which doesn't tell you very much. So, <laughs> like, did you even read it, Mom? Come on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, give it to your target audience, um, but give them a questionnaire so that you can really get some good feedback. Because again, if you're giving it to a target audience and you're not giving them any questions, if they can read it and say, "Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it's a good book. I'll buy it." It's like, "What does good mean?" So. <laughs> what did you think of this particular character or what was the ask them what do you think the main message of this particular chapter was what do you think the main message of the story overall was would you recommend this to somebody and why why would you recommend it and that will inform you as to whether they've really got your message or whether your message is clear enough for them it makes so much sense no that's a really really good suggestion in fact it like it helps you get some clarity on yeah, if you've communicated the main idea that you wanted to communicate, like uh, with the software creation stuff, just as an aside, like I would make these pages, these explanatory pages about what the software did. Uh, and I would ask people to read them and they'd read it. And usually like they'd read it and we'd be on a Zoom call or something together. And then I'd be like, all right, so you got it? And it's like, yeah, I read it. And, uh, and then I would say, please close that tab now, right? And if you had to tell me what that page was about, how would you describe it? And I would, it was so informing if they were like, oh, well, what I remember is that it, you know, it did this, this, and this. And if that was actually what I wanted them to remember, I'd be like, yeah. But if they said, oh, I remember there was some orange coloring and uh, there was something about foams. You're just like, oh man, I, I did not do a good job. <laughs> and by the way, how do you, I'm not exactly sure how you even pronounce that. The booty. Booty. Booty, I think. Yeah, she's another author, actually. Hey. What's up, booty? Uh, I'll tell you. So, so yeah. So, okay. I like to ask people on the show. And we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but you know, with regards to finding your audience, right? If there was one thing that people could continuously do, just something small, something that they could focus on in the in the like the idea formulation stage, as they're trying to find that audience and narrow it down from everybody into something something art like that you can articulate. What would you say? What would you suggest that they do? If they're for that specific reason to narrow down who their audience is. Yeah, something something small that they could do that would be like the biggest impact, right? Like maybe, for instance, uh, it might be, it might be that they just talk to one of their audience members every single day, like a potential book reader. Hmm. I was going to actually go deep, and I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking, hmm, it sounds really strange. But <laughs> <laughs> let's hear it. Oh man, let's hear this. <laughs> Is that, this is just off the cuff now, so I don't know how it's going to come out. <laughs> just give yourself, I mean, one of the things I would say, is, aside from the part of you know, working out who your audience is, is really spend some time with yourself, taking 10 to 10 minutes, even half an hour a day just for you, just to develop your mind, have that peace, have that quiet, really just connect with yourself. But if we're going to go as far as 
how to get into a target audience, you can so bear with me. You could spend, you could go out for a walk with your target reader, right? In role of that target reader, 10 to 15 minutes, half an hour if you can manage it. Get into character of that target reader. How do they feel? How's their day going today? Have a chat with them. Have some inner dialogue with them. Run some ideas by them and see what answers you can get. Now, I haven't tried this before. I just, because you asked such an interesting question, it just came to me. So I'm actually going to try and do this myself. <laughs> Wait, so you're talking about like, walking alone by yourself in the countryside and then having a mental conversation with your ideal reader. No, I like that. Like that role play. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, exactly. But if if your target reader is someone who likes shopping a lot, just leave your credit card at home. <laughs> right? Like don't get into character. Don't get too much into character. Yeah, exactly. No, but that's but that's that's smart. Um that's uh that's good. I like that. Booty likes it. Yay, Booty. <laughs> and Peter, Peter's here. I know you called him in. Yeah. I don't know if he's still watching, but Peter is the man. Uh, he's been on this show. And uh, and I'll tell you, um, I think that's I think the role playing thing is is a really good idea. And you could even if you were if there were two people, you could even swap like if it was if it was you and me and I was your ideal reader, I would flip this. I would flip the script, and I would be you, and you would be the ideal reader. And I'd ask you all kinds of questions, and I could see, you know, yeah. what it is that you were saying. Like, uh, really put yourself in those shoes. I'm getting inspired. I might carry this over to one of my workshops. Start doing some drama workshops. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. That would. I mean, it would be really informative. You know. Uh, almost like method acting in a way. Anyway, uh, it's, but that's, I think that's really, I think that's really important. And honestly, not just for anybody that's writing a book, but anybody that's trying to create anything that other people will use. Um, it's so important to know that kind of thing. Uh, so let's go back really quick to what you, what you were going to say, right? Just taking time, like half an hour for yourself. What do you mean by that? Well, I think it's become more and more prevalent to me anyway during this lockdown period. I was rushing about from place to place, doing this, doing that, going to this event, going to that event, teaching, coming back, doing consultations. And I never took, never had enough time just to be, literally be just to ground, just to, whew. And what I've loved about um, this period of time is that I've just become so much more aware of myself as a whole person. You know, what do I need to eat? Not, oh, I'm hungry, I need to quickly get something and shove it down my throat as I'm walking from A to B. But actually, let me sit down and make something decent for my, you know, that's nourishing for me. Um, and just working on our minds, I meditate a lot. I meditate every morning and every evening. And I, I can tell the difference if I haven't meditated in the morning um, than when I haven't. Because meditation just sets, sets the tone for the day. So have a routine so you're not waking up and saying right god i've got to have my coffee and now i've got to check my emails i've got to do that because you just lose yourself so i think there is a lot to be gained in just connecting back to ourselves and as a writer i found that it really helps with creativity because your mind's not in autopilot all the time your mind has time to switch off connect back and when you're quiet that's when all the creative I, you just get into more of a flow you so. beat me to the punch, Danny. I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you if you did this consistently for thirty days, but you just answered it. You're absolutely right. Like, you know, quieting the mind. If the if the end goal is to have the most potent and powerful creative ideas that you can, right? Then I feel like yes, you're absolutely right. You need to quiet the mind to let those ideas surface to the top. Yes. So is that what? That's basically. Do you find that the ideas, if you meditate, take some time for yourself in the morning, that those ideas come to you throughout the day? Or is it like the best ideas come to you during this 30 minute period? You try and write them all down and then you just move on with the day? Um, like, they, like, don't, they don't come through the, the 30 minute period necessarily. I'm, I'm somebody where <laughs> my everyone's got different times when their inspiration comes. Mine is very much in the morning. Sometimes on my Facebook posts, I wrote morning insight. And I'll wake up and I'll have like a download of information or, or insights that have come to me that I, I write and post. Um, and then the other time is probably really inconvenient if you've got a nine to five. 
I get idea if I'm not asleep by a certain time, like say midnight or one o'clock, the ideas are like, and I'll be up all night. <laughs> so it depends. But I think when you take time out, for me, if I find that my mind's getting too clogged or I'm overwhelmed, I've got, you know, I live in London, so we're not, there's not a lot of countryside around here, but, you know, I go to the park and I have a walk and I find when I quiet myself and when I'm, when I'm in nature, that's when the inspiration comes. And so that sets me up for the day and it could come any point after, um, you know, I've had a walk in the park and had that quiet time. It just kind of like zings you like a zap of electricity sometimes where you just, you're just thinking about something completely different and then it just hits you and you're like, oh man, that's good. Yeah. Do, you carry, do you carry around like a, like a notepad or something? Oh my gosh, you don't know how many, I've got a whole drawer full of notepads. <laughs> That's from when I've, um, I've got all my old school books. So I've got notepads. I've been decluttering during this time, but I've got so many notepads from when I was 17 years old up until 41 of like writing streams of writing. I'll never throw it away. So I have notepads everywhere, and I'd say it's organized chaos. I've got something over here, and I'll start that book for something else, and I've got another book over here with other stuff, and I've got journaling there. So it's really interesting. <laughs> it's really interesting. Only I get it, <laughs> you know. Well, it's, I feel like it, it's just the natural way that the mind works. You know, it's it's like constantly expansive. It's pulling all of these stimuli in, and it's you know I feel like intelligent people try and take all of that in and process all of this different information at the same time. And it's no wonder that you just have ideas all over the place. It's only then that you can get them all onto paper <laughs> in some semblance uh, that you could then look for patterns and say, yeah, this was really cool. And this was really cool. And these two things relate. And like, this is a great idea now. And well, let's, let's pursue it. 100%. Exactly. Yeah. I love it. I love a notepad, mate. I have, have you ever used one of these? Actually, I have them. Look, so I traveled around a lot and uh, I would always carry around pens until I found uh, one of these, right? Oh, well, okay. Have you ever seen these? What is They're, it? It's called a, a Fisher Space Pen. And, wow. and I'll tell you, it's like 15 or 20 bucks here in the States, right? But it folds up, right? Really small. It's waterproof. It writes everywhere. It writes upside down. And they call it the Space Pen because there's a little pressurized capsule in there, and it yeah. helps with the ink flow. But... Uh, this is my go-to now. It's so easy to carry and just jot down notes and stuff with this thing. It's incredible. What about you? What do you use? I want one. <laughs> <laughs> I want one of those. Put it on my list. Um, I've got, I've just got a regular pen. I have got um, Conscious Dreams publishing pens. Uh, I don't know where they are now. I love them. We, we give them out um, whenever we do workshops, but obviously we're not doing workshops at the moment so i've got a whole heap of pens <laughs> i just use i just i just use them but um i don't have a that, that would be my special pen i would say but i don't have i don't have anything as smart as that josh it's just easy to carry like if it was i don't know it's different for me because uh unless i have a backpack or something i can just throw that in there but if it's just a tiny little notepad with the pen oh man it's just so easy to do it's crazy um but uh Seriously, Danny, this has been an awesome conversation. Tell everybody what it is that you are doing these days. How can people connect with you, continue the conversation, reach out about uh, the publishing process? What do you got going on? So um, you can connect with us at our website is www.consciousdreamspublishing.com. Facebook and Instagram is also consciousdreamspublishing.com. I'm also on LinkedIn under Danny Blechner and Twitter under Dreams Conscious. Uh, we're offering free 30 minute consultations, which you can book via the site. There is a, a separate link to that as well. But if you go to the website, all the information is there where you can book too. I like it. I like it. And by the way, like if you book one of those consultations, it's at any stage, right? Like you, you could be at any stage. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we, we have two different ones. So the, the free 30 minute consultation is for those who have an idea. Maybe they don't know where to start. Maybe they want to understand the process a little bit more and find out how we can assist them. We also do offer 45 minute book strategy calls uh, for those who they don't have to publish through us. Maybe you want some advice in regards to marketing, some of the work that we've spoken about today. Um, so it's a, a book strategy call I offer as well. I dig it. Seriously, you've got the process down, Danny. 
It's awesome. It's <laughs> very, you. very cool to see. Uh, and this conversation has just been great. Uh, I, 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 you know, I've never written a book. I probably will sometime soon. Um, but when I do, I will remember a lot of this. And to me, the hardest thing so far has been the audience thing, just like we were talking about, like figuring out and narrowing down the audience. Cause you want to help as many people as possible and don't exclude unnecessarily. But you know that from a marketing perspective, you've got to maintain that focus. Otherwise, otherwise it'll just be noise and no one will really listen. Oh, well, I've, I've, I've really, this is, this actually inspired me. I've got a couple of ideas just from this interview. It's great. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Yes. Same here. Same here. Well, uh, before we go, do you have any, you know, last minute little tidbits of wisdom that you'd like to share with people before we take off? Well, procrastination. I researched that 84% of people want to publish a book. Of that eight or only five percent go on to fulfill their dream. So that is seventy-nine percent of stories lost, seventy-nine percent of voices silenced, seventy-nine percent of books that will never be written. Life is precious. If you have something, even if it's not writing a book, maybe you want to set up your own business, maybe you want to, you know, change the traje trajectory of your life, you know, this is the time. Don't allow fear or doubt to hold you back. I like it. I think uh, that is a really important. Actually, that's a really interesting statistic, too. Um, I'm trying to think if I know anybody that doesn't want to write a book. I can't think of one person. Oh, wow. You know, you know? like uh, and it's all about who you surround yourself with. But even still, like they either have or they want to for a fact. I know. So anyway, so you're right about the super high percentage of people. And uh, this has just been great, Danny. Like. Uh, uh, and Peter says, great interview, guys. You made the process of writing a book seem less intimidating. I hope so. Like, Danny, you definitely got away with words, uh, making the process seem less intimidating. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Well, this is Josh, Danny, and Elvis the Rooster, who is lurking around here somewhere, uh, who has been relatively quiet. Um, thank you so much, guys. We stream live Monday through Saturday, six days a week. Join us for another amazing episode. And if you would like to participate, see some behind the scenes stuff, go to firebuilderslive.com and see how you can support the show. Danny, thanks again. This has been so much fun. Thank you. Take care. See you guys.